and adjust. These are parts that come off the skin. Cutaneous so, glands would be things like uh, oil glands, sweat glands. Which I'll close the blinds when you get a chance. It's easier to see the notes if you do. So hair comes off the skin, and so it's a appendage of the skin. Hair follicles are basically the part that makes the hair. It's skin cells around the hair that create new cells. Nails. So just like hair, uh, nails are mostly protein, just keratin. So both nails and hair are really not many cells at all. They're really just a, a bunch of protein bound together. Are you okay, Michael? Um, all exocrine, exocrine glands are ones that move fluids out or move chemicals out. So exocrine glands are ones that secrete chemicals onto the skin. This would be um, oil glands, sebaceous glands, another word for that, and the sweat glands. Oil glands are by the hair, you can see it right here. And then sweat glands are just pores that come out in different places in the skin. So these glands are formed by the bottom layer of the epidermis, stratum basal, and it moves down through the dermis. So they're created right here in this, you know, this dark purple layer, and then they push down further into the dermis as they grow. So oil helps a lot of moisture in the skin. Without oil, your skin's gonna crack because water leaves. And as that happens, the cells shrivel up and they start to pull away and you get cracking in the skin. Sebaceous glands secrete oil um, along with fat. So basically it, it's broken down cell parts and the cell parts contain fat along with proteins. And the main purpose of oil is again, to just lock in moisture into the skin. It keeps the hair and the skin soft, pliable, and waterproof. It also has an acidic part to it, which kills bacteria and viruses. So if the oil glands are infected, that's acne. And so there's a medication that people take for acne, sometimes called Accutane, where it basically just limits oil production in your skin. But it's really a last resort for acne because without oil, your skin again gets cracked and it, 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 it's, it's really bad for your skin to not have oil on it. And so it can lead to worse problems than acne if you use Accutane. But if you have an overproduction of oil, then that can lead to acne. But the way to help limit acne would be to keep your skin moisturized. Because if your skin does become dry, then the oil glands are become more active and secrete more oil to keep moisture in. So using moisturizer helps limit acne because oil is going to be limited if your skin already is moisturized. But if your skin 
gets dry, then it's just the opposite. More oil is going to be secreted, which can cause more acne. Is it the same thing at all with eczema? Eczema is really different. Um, now, dry skin can make it feel worse, though. So keeping lotion on your skin with eczema is going to help the itching. But eczema is not an infection. Um, it's an allergic reaction to something. And so it's an allergy that um, antihistamines can help, like taking Benadryl and Zizol or something like that can help with, with um, eczema. But it's nothing to do with, with having dry skin. It's just as a result of eczema, you can have dry skin. And uh, keeping it, the you know, dry skin on its own can be itchy. And so if you have eczema on top of dry skin, it just gets even more itchy. So what is it that you're allergic to? It can be different things. I mean, it can be all kinds of different things. As and some people just have it's called atopic eczema uh, or um, idiopathic, where they just don't know the reason. A lot of people just go through their life having some kind of rash and they don't know why they have it. There's they can't find out a reason for it. Now they can treat it though. I mean, they can they can give you things like steroid creams. Um, and it can help keep it, you know, keep the itching inflammation down. But many times you don't really know why you have things like hives or eczema. Or they usually can't find a reason for it. Can I yeah. Is it? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Is it true that like you can get hives in the form of a fever? Yeah, hives. That's right. You can. Yeah. Like a couple of years ago, I got hives, and we thought that I had like this huge problem, and we thought it was like an allergy thing. We went to this like allergist person. But then, and we like even went to the hospital because we were worried it was like gonna like get in my throat and then like I would have yeah. been and stuff. But apparently, like we found out that it was like just a form, like the way my body was fighting the fever. Yeah, hives come with infection a lot. So okay. almost all, almost always, when you have hives, it's from an infection. Okay. And so that's almost like eighty-five percent of hives cases are from an infection. So it's more likely from an infection than an allergy. By far. Yeah, only about 15% of cases, even less than that, maybe like 10% of cases of hives are actually from an allergy, like a food allergy, environmental allergy. That's weird that that's the initial reason they thought it was, like, mm -hmm. like that they initially thought it was an allergy, if most of the cases are. Like yeah, I guess they didn't, I mean, they're not specialists, I guess, they're not specialists in allergies, but yeah, I mean, people don't think that, but hives usually, it's just something that happens on your, on its own. Um, through a virus or an infection. The body is basically just inflammation is the body's response to infection. And so you get inflamed and that's what you see as hives. But the body's trying to flush out the toxin. In the process, you get a red patch in your skin, you get puffy, you, get, you, you have a fever, but it's nothing to do with an allergy. The Because allergy and viruses, like it, it's it's a similar re response. In both cases, the body thinks there's a foreign invader has to, to kill. So if you have an allergy to say, you know, to, to peanuts, when you eat peanuts, the body thinks that you have a virus, it has to attack. So that's, it's the same exact response as if you had a virus in your body. So that's, that's why it's similar to responding to allergy versus a, an infection. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. But yeah, eczema and hives, they, they do usually go in their own. I mean, not always, just depends on the reason why you have it. Um, but you especially, well, both eczema and hives, you both can grow out of um, as you get older. And they can go away without doing anything to, to treat it. But others can be more chronic, but that's usually less common. Sweat glands in the body, you have about 2.5 million throughout the skin. These are tiny tubes that originate in the dermis or even down to the fat layer. And there's a, it opens up on your skin and the opening is called a pore. And so the tube opening on the surface of the skin is a pore, which brings out fluid. It's mostly water, but it does contain some things like salt and waste products. Urea and uric acid are also secreted with the sweat, but by far it's mostly water that's secreted. But you do lose, lose some salts when you sweat. And so that's why if you're really active, you know, especially if you're like, you know, have a sporting event and you lose a lot of water, you don't want to just drink water because you're losing more than just water. You're losing electrolytes. And so if you drink just water, you can actually feel worse. You can drink too much water and, but not have the right balance of salts. And that can actually make your blood vessels get bigger and you can feel worse and have a worse headache because you need to replace electrolytes too. 
But well, where does it have an imbalance of salts, like over? What, oh, like over? Yeah. yeah, you certainly can. Um, it's just that you don't usually feel as bad. I mean, usually you feel worse when you have less than too much salt. Um, but too much salt, you can get high blood pressure, which if it becomes chronic can be a problem. But the, other, the only other thing you'd have would be just dehydration with too much salt, which you can easily fix. So yeah, it's easy to go over. It's just that you don't really feel as bad when you go over versus being under. Shall I get those down? Um, eccrine glands respond to a, a higher body temperature. So these are glands that are, you know, that are sweat glands that respond to a higher temperature in the body. These are common on your forehead, neck, and back. <clears throat> But we sometimes sweat when, when we're not hot, we're just nervous, excited, frightened, or in pain. And so there's different kinds of glands that would be secreted. When you're not feeling hot, you're just having some kind of emotional a distress or some kind of um, strong emotion. And so that's secreted, they're called apocrine glands. When they're secreted when somebody's upset, frightened, in pain, or excited. And they secrete different things. Hmm. That's a good question. Hmm. What? Well, yeah, when you're frightened or in pain, I don't know why that would help you. Yeah. It might not. I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. Like, whenever we have like piano posters and stuff, my hands get like so sweaty. Mm -hmm. Do you have like extra sweat glands in your hands or something? You don't have extra. It's just that those are only secreted when you're nervous. Yeah. Like, so they're not secreted when, usually, when you feel hot. It's more of just when you're nervous that they're secreted. So, I'm not sure if there, maybe there's no purpose for them. Maybe they, they, maybe they don't help you. I don't know. I'll have to look and see about that. I never thought about that. Read other people's emotions. Yeah, I guess that, that might be, yeah, maybe so. Maybe that's why people blush and, you know, shake when they're nervous because you can, you can tell how they're feeling. And maybe that does help other people to have empathy for them and understand what they're, how they're feeling. I don't know. That's a good point. So these become active during puberty. Um, they're common in the armpit area and the groin. They get more active as you get older. And they have a certain scent to them because there's, you know, your skin has a certain kind of bacteria that's unique to you. Everybody has their own bacteria, different kinds of bacteria on their skin. So they have a unique scent. Now, we're not always aware of the scent consciously, but we can sense it subconsciously. So there are certain... And this is uh, important for attraction and for like they've had these studies where females will be given a gym shirt and they don't know who it's from and they will choose the male gym shirts over the female gym shirts be because based on the smell they don't even really know the smell like it's not a true smell yeah, really but they will they will sniff it and they can just the based on how they feel they would choose the male gym shirts that have been used over the female gym shirts even though they're not told anything about it. And there's not really a, a, a defined sense that they can really point to. So there's some chemicals that are more subconscious that you pick up on. And that's what, so that's one reason why we have these. Wait, I'm sorry, would like your gay person pick the same? They would have, yeah, they, I didn't hear the study, but probably mm -hmm. they would pick the same sex one, you would think. Yeah. But uh, that's interesting. I never really thought about, like, you know, I could they did that. Right, yeah. Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, I don't know if they did try that or not. But yeah, you would think that would fall that that would happen. Yeah. But yes. I mentioned this before, but you can walk into a room and kind of like feel like the tension in the room. You can understand. And, and so this also goes along with that as well, that chemicals are secreted in the room that you can pick up on subconsciously. And so there probably is a way to communicate with other people. Like epithelial glands, probably it, its main purpose probably is for communication and to let people know how you're feeling. <clears throat> Yeah, 
so epocrine glands are only are used for cooling down. Epocrine glands are used um, not to cool down. They're used for other purposes. Yes, that's good. Does everybody have these down? Um, hair is present on most skin surfaces, except for a few exceptions. <laughs> and lots of times you have hair that you just can't see very well because it's just so small, uh, or it's just uh, you know white or transparent. <laughs> hair follicles produce hair, and so they're the skin layer that makes hair that goes around it. <laughs> So skin cells become hair. They die, they keratinize, they become full of protein, and that creates the hair. Wait, how does that work? Because isn't there like the hair follicle and it like goes deep down into your skin? Yeah, or? it's in the dermis, like it's right here, yeah. So that's like in the dermis, which is the alive layer, right? Mm -hmm. So how, do, like, does it fall back? Like, how does that work? Well, as the cells are pushed upwards, they die. So about the yellow part is where they're living. And as they get further from the blood supply, they die. But it has to be a different kind of cell, right? It's a different cell. kind of cell. Okay. Yeah, it is. But yeah, it's still yeah. these cells um, have keratin in them. These cells don't. Okay. And so the cells with keratin do die pretty quickly. And the cells without keratin in the dermis, they don't die as quickly. Okay. Yeah. And these are also pushed up. And as they're pushed up, they, they die from being pushed up too. So as cells are flattened, they die off and they have keratin that's produced and they, they create more keratin as they get older, which makes them die faster. So cells that move upwards die and they become keratinized, becoming hair. I'm oh, sorry. They do. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so chemotherapy's um, purpose is, it's a poison. It's supposed to kill the fastest dividing cells. And cancer is, is usually the fastest dividing cell in the body. But next after cancer is hair cells, skin cells, and intestinal cells. And so chemotherapy also kills the cells in your hair follicles, and so you lose your hair, and then your intestine, which makes you nauseous. And so that's why chemotherapy has those two side effects losing hair and being nauseous because it kills those cells next after the cancer. So it, chemotherapy is definitely a really last resort because there's a lot of bad side effects. So you're taking a poison in your body. And so it, it, kill, it kills your cells and you have long-term side effects too from that because you've been poisoned. Um, I think mostly just say digestion problems and because you know it ruins your intestinal lining for a while. Yeah. How does this target the fastest growing cells? It doesn't target them. It's just that those cells that are fastest growing take in the nutrients first. So cancer cells, because they're fastest growing, hog the nutrients in the body. And that, so that's why they get them. They get more of them than your other cells. Your other cells get them, but cancer cells get more of them. And so they die because of that. Wait, so when, if you like were on chemo, so if you had leukemia or something and you were on chemo when you're little, mm -hmm. would that... Like maybe stunt your growth? Oh, I'm sure it would. Yeah, okay. yeah, I, I would imagine so. Yeah, there. Yeah, chemotherapy is not pleasant. It's it's a last resort because it's it's really very dangerous. Yeah. So even that can kill you. Even chemotherapy on its own can kill you. Has it ever happened? Before? Oh yeah, yeah. People can die from chemotherapy because you're getting a poison, and it's yeah. a very powerful yeah. poison. But you know, cancer can kill you too, and so you're just choosing. The lesser two evils in that yeah. case. Yeah, and they can try to correct it, you know, but doesn't know. I mean, and, and so now we're a lot better and safer than we used to be with chemotherapy. And so it definitely is safer than it used to be, but there's still a lot of risk involved in chemotherapy. So you only do it if you have to. Do you like, do you like yeah, you usually do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you, you lose weight because, you know, you can't really digest the nutrients. Yeah. I mean, your intestine, your intestine has been destroyed and you can't take in nutrients. 
So yeah, they lose a lot of weight and they have no appetite usually. So they can get IVs to help get nutrients, but yeah, their appetites for a while, it's just not there. So yeah, cancer is just a horrible disease. It just affects so much of your body. Is everybody have these down? Yeah. Okay, just to more in detail about the hair follicle, you can see it up close right here. So the cells that are around the hair right here, these become keratinized. Hair grows in the matrix in the deepest layer of the epidermis. And that's what we're seeing along here. Yes. Uh, melanocytes along here give the hair pigment. And as they're, as they're pushed up, they become flatter, they become more keratinized and they start to die off. Yes. Why is it that like, okay, so the more your skin is exposed to sun, the darker the melanin becomes in your skin, mm -hmm. but also the more your hair is exposed to sun, like the lighter it gets. Yeah. So how does that work? Because the sun can break down pigments too. And so the sun can make pigments fade and you don't have um, living cells in your hair. So in response to losing pigment, you don't have cells in your hair to make more pigment. But in your skin, your skin has living cells in the deeper layers. And so in response to being sunburned, they will release more pigment and make you darker over time. But your, your hair is not that way. Your hair is just basically just chemicals with no living cells. And so it's the same as being out, like, like you see the leaves in the fall turn colors, the sun destroys the green pigment. And then you have um, red and orange pigments below that that you didn't see before, but now come out and are more visible. And so that's like your hair too, is the same thing where your, your hair can have different kinds of pigments. The sun can destroy and break down um, a dark pigment and then make the lighter ones visible and make your hair look lighter because of that. But then there's no cells that are in your hair to make more melanin at that point. And that's also why you can dye your hair and it stays that color for a long time because you don't have cells to replace that dye or to move it out of your body. Now, what you will see happen though, people who dye their hair is over time, the roots will be the, their true color because the hair is pushing out new cells. But the old color that you dyed it will stay in your hair as it grows out yeah. because the cells don't have any, there's no cells in your hair to destroy it, break it down. And so it, it's permanent because of that. Mm -hmm. um, your hair has different textures based on the hair follicle shape. So if you have a, an oval hair follicle versus a flat versus a round one, you're gonna have different textures to your hair. So if you have a very circular hair follicle, you get straight hair. It's usually coarse, straight hair. If it's more of an oval shape, you get smoother, silkier, wavy hair. <clears throat> Curly hair, it's a very flattened oval. And then even curlier hair, it's even a flatter oval to it. So, and these are due to your genes. So based on genetics, it will make your, the shape of your hair follicle a certain way, which will then create a certain texture to your hair. So for my first area of your gene, um, we're just like one of the from when you have hair like it won't mix so well. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about hair follicles. I mean, almost every gene you have in your body is a mixture of both of your parents and is a mixture of several genes and not just one gene. It's so hair follicles themselves, I'm not sure what the gene is, but it's usually multiple genes that are influencing almost every trait you can think of in your body. Can your hair become curly after, like my dad used to have straight hair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, your textures definitely can change. I mean, your hair color and texture can certainly change over time due to a lot of different things. I mean, it can be hormonal changes. It can be environmental changes. Your genes can turn off. Genes can turn on. So there's all sorts of things that can be changing your, the way your hair um, looks. Isn't there, like, I, had a, I remember this girl had really straight hair and then she gave birth and then she had straight hair for a little. That happens a lot where, where, yeah, women have, you know, their hair color changes after a pregnancy. There are different textures to the hair. Yeah, because hormones do change 
way the genes are expressed and permanently sometimes. So you can see right here that the blood vessels nourish the hair follicle because those are living cells. And so they do get nourishment from the blood vessels, but as they get further up, they don't get them. And as they die, as they get further up. Hair follicle has, has two main parts to it. You can see right here, it has the fibrous sheath right here in blue, and that's from the dermis. And then you have epithelial root sheet right here in pink. So the dermis provides a blood supply to the hair bulb, and that's the deepest part of the hair follicle right here. So that's where the living cells are. And the hair matrix is where growth happens. Melanocytes, I talked about that, gives you a hair a certain color. Um, blood vessels are in this area. Fat is just right below it. The cuticle is the hard part of the hair that is the hard protein layer around it. Mm -hmm. Is it true that if like you let your hair grow out long enough, it just falls out? Well, like no, naturally all hair does have a cycle. Like, so your hair is constantly falling out like every day. Um, it's just that if it's longer hair, you're more aware of it. And so it seems like you're losing more hair when you have longer hair just because you can see it more easily. But so there's no difference in how much hair you lose. It just looks like there's more because it's just a bigger amount. A longer amount. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that it would just be so heavy that it would go a little easier? I mean, yeah. slightly, I suppose, but not really. Yeah. No, I mean, not much. Yeah. Um, yeah, it really wouldn't change a whole lot, no matter how long your hair is. But your hair naturally has these cycles where it, it just goes from, you know, falling out to growing new hair. And normally it's matched up well where that you can replace what you're losing from a day-to-day -day -day basis. But sometimes cycles can get out of whack where you can lose a lot of hair all at once. As I showed you the other day, alopecia, where you have these patches of hair falling out. And that's usually can correct itself pretty quickly once it goes back in the cycle. Um, you will then regrow that hair and not have those patches of bald spots. When I was 16, I had a hairdresser tell me I was going to go bald by 25 because um, it was the same thing where I just, it was just a cycle of losing a lot of hair all at once. And because of that, she freaked out. She said, you're going to get, you're going to have to go to the doctor. And so they gave me Rogaine and I never took it, but um, it just makes you, like if you're balding, it makes hair grow back. Um, not a you want to be yeah, I didn't want to take that. So I, I didn't. I was fine. I didn't believe her. But it just, it naturally happens where your hair just falls out. And then sometimes so the cycles are just heavier than normal and you lose a lot all at once. Why does but yeah, any stress can change your hormones and cortisol. And hormones, uh, stress hormones especially can make things go faster in your body, which would include the turnover in your hair. And also just by pulling your hair, like when you're stressed, you might pull your hair more, oh. a lot more, which can make you lose hair. Mm -hmm. If you keep on losing a lot of hair, that can be a thyroid problem. So you do want to get that checked out if you keep on losing a lot of hair, but yes. Um, so it can, yeah. I mean, it's not always, but it, it can. <laughs> yeah, it, stress can cause premature balding. I mean, you can, I mean, grain of hair, balding of hair, that definitely can be. Is that why guys bald earlier than girls? Um, that's due to their genes. Their, oh. their, their genes are, are, I mean, certainly if you have more stress, you, you, could, you could go bald ease more quickly or faster. But it, it's really because guys have a gene that makes their hair bald. Well, women don't usually have that gene. So that, that's usually why. Yeah, actually. Yeah, not usually. Like no, I mean, some women do the gene for balding, but it's pretty rare. Um, they don't usually have that. Wait, is it true that like when you're younger and like you put your hair back and like really tight ponytails, so, like 
I, I mean, that sounds right to me. I mean, I would imagine so. If you don't want to put a lot of stress in your hair follicles because, yeah. I mean, you certainly could damage your hair follicles if you have a lot of stress on them. That's true. So genes determine the hair color. And there's different kinds of pigment that cause different hair colors, as I mentioned earlier. So if you have dark hair, you have eumelanin. Blonde hair or red hair, you have pheomelanin. And then you have various genes that control pigment. And so generally you have several genes that give you a certain hair color. And that's why you have a wide variety of hair colors. You don't just have three or four hair colors. You, you have you know, maybe, I don't know how many, 30, 50 hair colors. You have a, a wide variety of, of shades of brown and blonde hair and red hair. And that's based on the genes giving you different amounts of pigmentation. And then white hair has no pigment at all. You're just seeing the protein. This is an up close picture of what a hair follicle looks like at the skin. So this is all dead skin that's around it. And so it's just burst out of the hair follicle. And this is the hair itself. This keratinized cells. And that's just pure protein. And that's the actual hair. Know what makes red, like red hair? Because I know that there has to be like a gene or something. Yeah, there's genes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's I a certain gene. Rare, though, like, yeah, because it, it's a recessive trait, which means you have to have both parents have that gene for red hair to pass on to the kids. And so um, blonde hair and red hair are both rare because they're recessive traits. And you have to have two parents have that gene to pass on to their kids. Yeah. So both parents have to have a history of pheomelanin? Not a history. Um, no, they don't have to have a history of it. Um, so what can happen is you can have a hidden gene. Like um, my sister and her husband both have really dark hair, but their kids all have blonde hair because, and nobody in my family has blonde hair, but they had that gene in, you know, they had, they carry that gene, but it wasn't expressed in them or their parents or their grandparents, but it was expressed in their kids because they were carrying the gene for blonde hair. Red hair is the same exact way. You can carry the gene for red hair and not express it. It can be a mutation too. And so it, that, that's how it started as a mutation. And so the first person who was redheaded, it came from a mutation. And so in a family, you could have somebody be redheaded just due to a change in the genes and the parents didn't carry the gene for red hair, but the kid gets red hair be, due to a, a mutation. But that's less common. Most commonly what's happened is that both parents did carry the gene for red hair, they didn't express it. Yeah. Is gray hair just from the cells not being able to produce enough pigment? Yeah, that's right. You have less melanocytes. Uh, the melanocytes die off and they just, or they can't produce pigment. And that can be due to genes um, just over time turning off as you get older. Um, or it can be due to environmental changes. It could be due to um, you know, like cancer, stress. stress. It can turn off those uh, melanocytes. It just depends on what's happening. But yes, uh, generally it's just genes that turn them off over time. Okay, red right hair by far is the least common hair color. They think blonde hair, I mean, there's some, you might have heard articles about this. They said blonde hair is going to die out in 2050 because it's just so rare, it's a recessive trait. It's not true, um, but there are some ar there's articles that are saying that. It is pretty rare though. I mean, no, it doesn't seem like to us it is, but for other parts of the world, yeah, it's, I mean, compared to the whole world population. Yeah, that's right. Even in this class, no one's actually blonde. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's really, I mean, like we have a lot of Germans over here and, you know, so that might be why we think there's more people who have. Mr. McKenna didn't think it was important enough to be here, so he's just chatting outside. I don't know. How oh, he's, things. oh, what's, who's he talking to? Uh, Grace and then two of the 11th graders oh. on. Okay, good to know. Either, All right, thank you. Yeah, I will talk to him about that. Thank you. Okay, um, 
I mentioned this earlier, I think, but goosebumps are from a muscle that pools on the hair. And so when you're cold or when you are nervous, it will move the hair upward. Um, as it is, it doesn't really serve a purpose right now. Because, I mean, but at one time we had a lot of hair. And, um, well, that's what they think anyway, they're not for sure, but they, they think humans had a lot more hair at one time on their arms and their legs. And um, if you have a lot of hair, like say like um, a cat has, then goosebumps can serve more of a purpose. Like for a cat, when they get fried, you've probably all seen that, they puff up there because the goosebumps cause the hair to, to move upward. They look bigger and um, that can scare off any predator that's wanting to attack the cat. And also it gives them a layer of insulation. So that would be um, a, you know, an advantage for, for animals who have a lot of hair, but for humans without having much hair, it doesn't really serve any purpose for us. So goosebumps don't really help from what we understand. Now moving the muscle, moving muscles can cause heat and that can warm us up a little bit. So it might be that you have slightly more heat generated when you move the little muscle, but it's so small there's not gonna be much heat generated. Which is the picture of them, what they look like. Yes. And so you can see that, you know, every hair is just standing up on end. And so that's what goosebumps do. And even you might not have hair present and you still could have goosebumps because the hair follicles they are still there, but the hair is just below the skin surface. Are those bumps <clears throat> the muscles flexing? The muscles flexing, yeah, that's right. Yeah, those bumps are from anything else? No, it's just that, yeah, it's the muscles are pulling the skin, making the skin uh, move upward. Oh. I think someone told me once that it was like fat coming to the surface. Mm, yeah, no, yeah, I don't know how that, I mean, go back to this picture, like, I mean, this is like, do you see where it is in the dermis? I mean, so. Let's go back to the, uh, here we go. I mean, I guess there's a little fat around it. You can see right here, there's that, but pulling the hair upward a little bit, I don't see how fast can it just move upward like that. Yeah. I don't really, no, I don't, I don't know how that would happen. Okay, we'll stop here for now. Let me give you some worksheets to do for the last part of class. Uh, let's talk about the test on Wednesday next week, just give you a heads up on that. So we'll start to review next week and have the test on Wednesday. Do you have other um, tests next week or other assignments? Theology on Thursday? Okay. okay. Doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to draw the two of them. 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 I'm going to draw the two of them.